Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. And uh, happy to be with you today uh, for the virtual reading group. We are um, nearing the very end of our reading of the Jewish writings, uh, this really wonderful book. Um, I have to say, uh, much richer than I knew it would be when I took it on. I had read about probably a third of this book before we all started doing this five or six months ago. And uh, it's been an exciting uh, process for me. So um, thank you all for, for being part of it. Um, uh, we're on the last section of the book, uh, that, which is the 1960s. Um, and it's really, um, really only about Arendt's uh, responses to the massive criticisms that she uh, encountered uh, when she wrote her book, um, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, so uh, we will be spending time on that the next few days, uh, this, this week and next week. So today we're reading the, the letter she wrote in response to Gershom Sholem and the letter, the answer she wrote to Samuel Grafton. And then we read the last two or three um, uh, uh, things in the book, essays in the book for next week. Um, and, and then just so you know, that's on the, uh, uh, today's the, um, today's the 10th. We read on the 17th, um, the, we finish the book on the 17th. And then uh, without a break, I just want to be clear, without a break, uh, we're going to go straight into um, uh, a series of texts that Hannah Arendt uh, wrote on anti-Semitism and race, primarily on race. Um, uh, and we'll read those for the next three months. Um, I, I went through this last in the last session. Make sure you take a look at the uh, schedule that's on the website. Uh, um, on the Hannah Arendt Center website under the virtual reading group, because there's not one book in which all of these essays are in that we're going to be reading on Arendt and race. And uh, you need to uh, make sure you have the material to the extent you uh, want to be able to read it in advance, which I hope you do. Um, so the first two sessions will be the origins of totalitarianism, chapters from that, which I assume many of you have, but if you don't, uh, you might want to get and then we'll move on. But the entire schedule is now on our website uh, at the hac.bar.edu uh, under virtual reading group. So uh, you can go find it there. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been reading um, about Hannah Arendt's writings on the Jewish question now for all for five months, six months. Um, and uh, what I think you'll see quickly, uh, you have seen, I hope, is, you know, the Hannah Arendt, the, this sort of political thinker, some would call philosopher, um, in many ways, larger than life intellectual figure. Um, I think many people, um, at, while she was alive, saw her as this intellectual, you know, the, the, the epitome of an intellectual. Um, and in many ways she was, um, but especially in the 1930s and 1940s, as you see, an enormous, enormous amount of the time and energy she spent writing were really about the Jewish question, about um, Zionism, about anti-Semitism, uh, about Israel, uh, about Palestine, about Jews in America, about refugees, um, you know, this was a woman who was stateless for most of this period, um, didn't, you know, felt very vulnerable, had been in a concentration camp, had been arrested. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not surprising. And yet we don't often think of her, um, her writing along those lines. And, and so much of, of her later writing in her books, more philosophical books, even The Human Condition and On Revolution, um, I think have their material phenomenological ground here in her engagement with questions around um, the Jewish question. And so um, these have been uh, really 
uh, important essays to to read in order to to understand one of the many backstories of Hannah Arendt. Um, and that's what I think is so interesting about her as a writer. I mean, clearly, the Jew, her Jewishness and the Jewish question is one of the backstories of Hannah Arendt. Another is um, her, her her Heideggerian lecture teaching. Another is her Karl Jaspers teaching, um, uh, and then others as well. Uh, and then, of course, being in America, I think, importantly changed Hannah Arendt's um, view of the world. Um, and so these are all uh, important factors in who she is. Um, by the time of the 1960s, she's, of course, known less for the work she's done on the Jewish question and more for her work on things like the origins of totalitarianism, uh, the human condition, uh, her essays between past and future. Um, these have all already come out and have made her um, quite well known, maybe one of the best known uh, intellectuals in the United States, certainly, and, and, and certainly in the United States and Europe. Um, and then she is, um, uh, she asks uh, to cover um, the Eichmann trial, the trial of Otto Eichmann, uh, after he's kidnapped in from Buenos Aires, uh, and go to, to Jerusalem to cover the trial. Um, she's there for the first, for all the opening remarks and for the first two weeks of the trial. Then she goes and takes vacation visiting um, Carl Jaspers and others, and then comes back to the end of the trial. Um, she writes a five-part uh, account of the trial uh, called Eichmann in Jerusalem in the New Yorker magazine. Um, and then uh, Penguin publishes the uh, edited versions of those, uh, those articles in the book Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. And then all hell breaks loose, right? And uh, I know we've read, uh, some of us together have read uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem in this group. Um, for those who haven't, you can go back and look at some of the lectures on the web. You can also go read the book. I encourage it. And we'll read it again at some point. It's a great book. Um, and uh, the book causes a controversy for a whole number of reasons. And I can't go, we're not going to go into all of it today. But um, a number of RN's friends also uh, took issue with the book and um, to, to greater or lesser degrees. And uh, if you ever saw the movie Hannah Arendt that was done by um, Margarita von Trata um, about now, about, I guess, probably almost 10 years ago, um, there's a character, Kurt Blumenfeld, um, who, 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 who makes strong critiques of the book. Um, most of the critiques that Blumenfeld is making uh, of the book are actually verbatim critiques made by Gershom Scholem to, for, for simplicity's sake, Margarita von Trotas collapsed Gershom Scholem and, 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 and Hans Blumenfeld into one character in the movie um, because she didn't want to have two characters. Um, uh, in any case, um, Scholem's critique has become one of the most cited and most uh, talked about critiques of, of RN's book. And when he wrote the critique to her in a letter, he asked if he could publish it. And she said, sure, but only if you also publish my response with it, and which they did. And it was published um, shortly after, I think in social research. And, um, and in this, in this, um, in this collection edited by um, Jerry Cohen and, and Ron Feldman, um, uh, we don't get Sholem's letter. Uh, we get Arendt's response, but I think you can get a sense of it. But just to, just to give you um, a little bit of sense of, of, of what the letter was like, um, I'll read uh, a couple lines from it. Um, first of all, just to make, let you know, Sholem and Arendt uh, were both German Jews. They met in Paris in the late 1930s, where they were both in exile, um, and they were both friends with um, Walter Benjamin, um, very close. Uh, and that's how they first came together and got to know each other as, as mutual friends of Benjamin. Um, 
And when Benjamin committed suicide uh, at the Spanish-Portuguese border in the Pyrenees, um, Arendt is the one who writes to Sholem to let him know in, in, a, in a truly gorgeous letter. And um, that maybe cemented their friendship for a long time. Uh, they also worked quite closely together, Sholem and Arendt, in the 1940s, uh, brought together by uh, Salo Boron, uh, the great Jewish historian um, who then taught at Columbia. And uh, Salo Boron was the head of uh, something called the European Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Committee. Uh, and Arendt, he hired Arendt when she first came to the United States and needed a job as the executive secretary for this committee. Um, interestingly enough, Arendt wrote an enormous amount about um, the Jewish cultural reconstruction work that she did, mostly in letters, and none of that's in this book on her Jewish writings. Um, just something I just thought of, it's worth pointing out. Um, if, you, if you do want to read anything about that, um, in the uh, collection of Arendt's letters with Gerhard Sch uh, Scholem, uh, which was um, edited by... Uh, I think um, Marie Luz cannot. Um, uh, there's long, long letters. I mean, almost a hundred pages, I think, worth in the middle of that book about their common work on trying to save Jewish cultural artifacts that had been, um, you know, destroyed or partially destroyed or hidden or stolen by the Nazis. And part of their work was to go through Europe uh, and categorize and collect. Uh, where all these um, Jewish artifacts were, and then figure out where to send them. And they ended up with a with a, a formula where 40% were sent to the United States and to new Jewish organizations there, 40% to Israel and the new organizations there, and 20% were then distributed around the world uh, to Jewish organizations. And so um, just to give you a sense of, A, Another aspect of Arendt's work on Jewish matters that has, again, except for people who I think really know Arendt well, largely been forgotten. Um, and secondly, uh, the depth of her connection with Gershom Sholem, first around their very close friend and his suicide, um, Walter Benjamin, and, and second, um, their work traveling around Europe together for almost a year, um, trying to locate Jewish cultural goods. That said, they got into a number of very intense arguments. Um, in the 1940s, Sholem was very critical of Arendt's work on Zionism. And then in 1963, after um, the, uh, the, Eichmann, uh, the Eichmann articles in the New Yorker come out and then the book, Sholem writes to Arendt. Um, and in, in near the beginning, he says this. I'll just read it to you because I think it's worth getting a sense of, 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 of what he writes. He says... After going on with some critiques, he says, nevertheless, the problem you pose is genuine. Why then does your book evoke such emotions of bitterness and shame for those who recognize this? Indeed, not for the author's subject matter, but for the author herself. Why does your account so dominate the events it records, which you rightly want people to reflect on? To the, degree, to the degree that I have an answer, I cannot hide it, if only because of my high regard for you. It will clarify what stands between us. It is the heartless, the downright malicious tone you employ in dealing with the topic so profoundly, that so profoundly concerns the center of our lives. There is something in the Jewish language that is completely indefinable, yet fully concrete. What the Jews call Ahavath Israel, or love of the Jewish people. With you, my dear Hannah, as with so many intellectuals coming from the German left, there is no trace of it. And then he goes on a little bit and he says, in treating such a theme, isn't there a place for the humble German expression, Herzentakt, or tact of heart? And so, um, you know, you can see clearly her book hit a nerve, more than a nerve. Um, and, you know, here's uh, someone she considered a very close friend. I think he considered her a close friend. And yet um, a kind of um, bitterness and shame for the author herself 
because of the tone, in a way, uh, of her writing. Um, uh, this is this is very much uh, what what uh, you know what she's responding to in this letter. That then is 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 she writes in New York City, July twenty fourth, nineteen sixty three, and she says, "I found your letter when I got back home a week ago." You know, she says, "I've been gone for five months, and as you can imagine, I had a lot to do." And now I'm finally um, getting around to answering you. And, um, and here's her answer. Um, she begins by uh, articulating a couple of things she simply thinks he gets wrong, right? Um, so the first thing she thinks he gets wrong is that he calls her in the part I just read to you um, um, as someone who comes from uh, the German uh, intellectuals of the German left, right? And she says, you know, I'm not proud of the fact that I'm not of the German left, but I'm not, and, and you should know that. Um, you know, her mother was a social democrat, but Arendt really was not a, a deeply political person when she was in Germany. She certainly was not uh, of the German left. She was, as she says, largely um, educated by German philosophy, um, not by German left politics. And so she says, you know, I'm not proud or not of this fact, but, you know, I'm simply, that's not the, who I was. Um, the second is that he, at one point in the letter says, you know, I had thought of you as a daughter of the Jewish people and, you know, no, I seem no longer to be able to. And, and she takes great offense at this and says, you know, I've never been tempted not to be a Jew. Um, uh, this is there's a line that Arendt repeats in 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 many of her her works that when you're attacked as a Jew you defend yourself as a Jew that's one aspect of it um, but I think for her it was more than that and this is also true throughout her work she never runs away from her Jewishness um, she's not a religious person she's not a religious Jew um, but as she says her Jewishness is part of the basic facts, the indisputable facts of my life, and I have never had the wish to change or disclaim facts of this kind. She then says, there is such a thing as basic gratitude for everything that is. This is um, her idea of what's called amor mundi, the love of the world, to be, to, to say, look, the world, you know, comes in all sorts of ways, good and bad, and yet our challenge is to love the world, to be grateful for it, and what she's saying here is I never um, ever uh, was ungrateful or, or sad to be a Jew. Um, uh, and, and that's an important part of her, her answer. Then she says, to come to the point, this is on 466, let me begin going on from what I've just stated with what you call Ahabath Israel or love of the Jewish people. Um, and, you know, uh, in a sense, not any. What, what Cholom is saying is that uh, Arendt's detachment, her irony, her willingness to try and understand Eichmann, not excuse or justify, but to understand, um, comes across to him and to many of other Jewish readers as not being a, not writing from out of a love of the Jewish people. Um, and her response to this, you know, is, is I think one of her most, most quoted and, 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 and thoughtful lines. And in many ways, it's the, it's the, it's the quote that will, to some degree, introduce and structure the conference that we have coming up at the Hannah Arendt Center, um, October 12th and 13th of this year which is a conference on friendship and politics. And Arendt writes, you are quite right. I am not moved by any love, in quotes, of this sort, love for the Jewish people. And for two reasons. I have never in my life loved any people or collective, neither the German people, nor the French, nor the American, nor the working class or anything of that sort. I indeed love only my friends. And the only kind of love I know of and believe in is the love of persons. 
this is a, you know, a, this is a, a bold statement, right? Um, I don't love any collective. I don't love any people. I don't love the working class. I don't love, you know, chess players. I don't love philosophers, right? I love my friends. Um, I love those people uh, who I can talk to and argue with, like you, Gerhard, I mean, is what she's saying, right? I love people who challenge me um, and I can uh, engage with in a conversation, in a dialogue, in a world. Um, and, and, and those are the people that, that, that I love, not any collective. And secondly, she says, this love of the Jews would appear to me, since I am myself Jewish, as something rather suspect. Um, and she says, you know, if I'm Jewish, I should be careful not to overprivilege um, the Jews and, and try and think from outside that perspective. Um, and she offers this example of a conversation she had with, she here calls it a he, but it's not as, as Jerome Cohn tells you in the notes, she's actually in the original named in the letter, it named Golda Meir, who was then foreign minister and later prime minister of Israel. Um, and she says she had this conversation with Golda Meir where um, Golda Meir said, you will understand that as a socialist, I, of course, do not believe in God. I believe in the Jewish people. And Arendt's response to this is to say that this is, in her opinion, disastrous. Um, she says the greatness of the Jewish people is that it once believed in God and believed in him in such a way that its trust and love toward him was greater than its fear. And now this people believes only in itself. What good could come out of that? And she adds, well, in this sense, I do not love the Jews, nor do I believe in them. I merely belong to them beyond dispute or argument. Um, I'd be interested to hear later what you guys think of such a statement. You can think of it within the Jews, but you can think of it within any group. Uh, if you're, a, if you're a, a professor, do you, you know, are you not, do you feel like you have to be more critical of professors? And do you want to say that you don't believe in academics, um, that you simply belong to them? or if you're um, a Muslim, or if you're white, or if you're black, how does this statement um, sit? And uh, you'll see the, the kind of, uh, the reason I think that it was so controversial um, when she made it. Uh, she, she goes on to talk about patriotism a little bit when she talks, we need, a, we need uh, opposition. I wanna look down at the bottom of 467 into 468. There's a line here where she says, um, she says, you, you know as well as I how often those who merely report certain unpleasant facts are accused of a lack of soul, lack of heart, or what you called Herzentat, right? This lack of, uh, lack of heart. And um, she says, I cannot discuss here what happens when emotions are displayed in public and become a factor in political affairs, but it is an important subject that I've described in her book on revolution, which came out the same year as uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem. In the next essay that we're reading for today, an essay, the, the answers to these questions by Samuel Grafton, she actually spends a fair time, fair bit of time unpacking this very idea. And so I thought I'd turn to that now and look at it. It's on page 477 to 478, um, where she says, um, there's another side to this matter, and in order to discuss it, I must refer, refer you to my book on revolution. Uh, and on 227 of the first edition of On Revolution, which sadly is probably not the page numbers of most of your editions of On Revolution, um, she speaks of what she calls public opinion, which in her view stands in opposition to authentic public spirit. Um, she says the founding fathers did not like democracy very much, and they abhorred it because they abhorred public opinion, uh, which was the opposite of what she calls public spirit. And then she quotes James Madison, and I, I just want to read this quote because I think it's such an extraordinary quote. And it's a quote that Arendt herself, I think, fully embraces and could have written, um, but it comes from James Madison. She says, for when men exert their reason coolly and freely on a variety of distinct questions, 
they inevitably fall into different opinions on some of them. When they are governed by a common passion, their opinions, if they are so to be called, will be the same. If we think, we will always differ on certain important opinions, right? If we think about the matter coolly, if we're independent in our thinking, we will not come to the same opinions. Opinions for her are always individual opinions. Whereas um, public opinion is not an opinion. It's a pseudo opinion that represents interest groups and it endangers even those few opinions that might exist outside of it by those who don't have the strength to share it. And so um, here in her response to Sholem, in much less, uh, in, 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 in just a very veiled way, she, she refers to that and, um, and talks about the danger of emotion in politics. Uh, the last two and a half pages are her defending herself against, again, certain things that she is said to have said in the book. One that Eichmann was a Zionist, which she does not say. And you, you know, this is one of those things where you have to almost laugh at the way people took that out of the book. She quotes Eichmann saying he was a Zionist in obviously an ironic way. And somehow people um, took that to be her, her saying she was a Zionist, that she thought he was a Zionist. Um, she never asked why Jews let themselves be killed. Again, that's something she accuses very clearly the Jewish prosecutor, um, Hausner, of doing over and over again, of asking people, why did the Jews let themselves be killed? And she sort of frustratingly asks, why does he keep asking this? And then people say, oh, she asked this. Um, she does... Uh, she says she raised a question about the cooperation of Jewish functionaries during the final solution. And she has in mind here largely the Unreta, the Jewish leaders, um, who uh, were given the task of um, providing the names of the Jews who would be put on the transports after they were told how many Jews had to be put on the transport. And some of them resisted, but most of them did not. And um, what she says is that until 1939, their cooperation with the Nazis was largely justifiable or excusable, not just, at least excusable, um, because, you know, they didn't know what was going on and, 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 and they were mostly helping people emigrate. And there's no reason to not do that orderly in an orderly way. But after 1940 or 41, when many of them began to hear about and know what was happening, that they were being sent to their deaths, um, she says this is more problematic and that we need to be able and willing to judge these Jewish functionaries. Um, and, and this is where she, she comes down. She says, we have to be able to say that they had a choice. They could, they couldn't really resist. There was no resistance that was possible, but they could have done nothing. And that itself, she thinks would have been infinitely better than uh, cooperating. And, and, and she says, it's worth judging them. Um, they, she, she talks about the death penalty because uh, Gershom Sholem Gershom Sholem was against it and she was, she, she was in favor of it in the sense that she thought Eichmann should be hung and killed and then she ends with the one thing she says that Sholem really does get right uh, which is that he says that she changed her mind on the nature of evil which she says she did do and she says, I'm glad you have raised this point on page 470 at the bottom. You are quite right. I changed my mind and do no longer speak of radical evil. It is a long time since we last met or we would perhaps have spoken about the subject before. Indeed, it is indeed my opinion now that evil is never radical, that it is only extreme and that it possesses neither depth nor any demonic dimension. It can overgrow and lay waste the whole world precisely because it spreads like a fungus on the surface. It is thought defying, as I said, because thought tries to reach some depth, go to the roots. And the moment it concerns itself with evil, it is frustrated because there is nothing. That is its banality. 
And so she suggests, as she does also in the life of the mind, that possibly the only thing that can stop us from evil is thinking. Evil is not demonic. It's not monstrous. It's like a fungus. It grows on the surface. And it largely comes from not thinking. Again, she elaborates this more in the next essay, next essay where she responds to um, uh, Grafton's questions. And on page 479 to 480, uh, she says, but to return to your question on the bottom of 479, it is of course true that evil was commonplace in Nazi Germany and that there were many Eichmanns. But I did not mean this. I meant that evil is not radical, going to the roots, radix, that it has no depth. And for this very reason, it is so terribly difficult to think about, since thinking by definition wants to reach the roots. Evil is a surface phenomena, and instead of being radical, it is merely extreme. We resist evil by not being swept away by the surface of things by stopping ourselves and beginning to think. And this is a formulation she uses in a number of places that thinking, what she means by stopping to think, moves us below the surface. And it's what um, she says is the way we resist evil because evil is always what keeps us on the surface. And she says the, the great example of such superficiality um, is Adolf Eichmann. He was a perfect example. And that every time he was tempted to think for himself, he said, who am I to judge if all around me think that it is right to murder innocent people? And so he basically never went to the depth. He stayed on the level of surface. And that's what she meant by the banality of evil. All right, um, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, uh, and there are two, at least two ways to engage in the conversation. One is through the chat. I remind you to please be respectful. Um, the chat is not open. Is that right? Uh, is, it, is it not working? Um, I, I see people chatting. Is it? Can they not see it? Uh, let's see if I can fix this. Um, having trouble. Uh, Send chat to everyone. It's not, I don't know why it's not uh, allowing me to. Yeah, I see the message, but not everyone can, but I don't know how to um, fix that. Hold on. Ah, here we go. I think, uh, I think I fixed it. Yeah. Okay. The chat should now be open and uh, you can, you can engage in the chat respectfully, or you can raise your hands through the reactions, go to the reactions button at the bottom and click on raise hand. All right. I think I fixed it. Thank you. So uh, sorry about that. I didn't realize it wasn't working. Chat is now open and the hands are up and we will begin our discussion on starting with Clara. Welcome Clara. Morning, Professor Roger. I just want to make a marginal question, and is this: What do you think about uh, how you say death penalty? Yes, that's that's the way you say in English, death penalty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Sarah, what do you think about a uh, death penalty? You yourself? Me myself? What yes. kind of question is that, Clara? My my opinion means very little on these matters. No, it came up um, when we when you were remembering that uh, Hannah Arendt was in favor of uh, death penalty in the case of Eichmann. So, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, you know, as someone who spent much of my early career studying jurisprudence, um, this is one of those questions that 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 comes up a lot um punishment uh in its in the classical tradition of, of 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 legal thinking is um pain suffered in response to a wrong right um uh the idea is that in any in in most crimes there are two things there's a wrong done and a harm done and um 
the civil law or tort law uh, generally concerns itself with harm. So if you someone harms you, you sue them for damages. Criminal law doesn't concern itself with harm. It concerns itself with wrongs. How do you, and the idea is that if someone has committed a wrong in the classic legal thinking of the Western tradition, um, they have, uh, what is the wrong they have done? Well, it is the pride, the hubris, the Greek, uh, at um, thinking that they have the right to disobey the law. And so they elevate themselves above the law. And that pride um, of self-elevation uh, is what must be um, cut down. And you cut that down by showing them, making them feel pain and making them understand that they are not higher than everyone else. And that if they do wrong, they will be um, lowered back into the uh, realm of law-abiding citizens who uh, are treated equally. Um, and so that the, the, the moral um, justification, the ethical legal justification for punishment is the um, attempt to punish, to make you feel pain in proportion to your wrong, in proportion to the pride um, that you did. And so if you commit murder, what's proportional to the pain of that pride? And it's traditionally been thought to be death. Um, you know, we don't, we're, a lot of us, there's a very strong Christian and moral component to that understanding. And a lot of us don't believe that anymore. And so the law has sought to find other justifications for capital punishment. Um, and those could include, um, uh, you know, prevention or deterrence or other things. Uh, and insofar as we define, we, we seek to justify um, killing someone by the fact that it will prevent other people from killing people, I think it's completely unjustified and um, I don't think deterrence is a is a helpful justification. And yet I think there's something deeply intuitively commonsensically right about someone who actually does take it in their hands to murder someone um, having to uh, be um, uh, punished. And how do you imagine that punishment if not for the death penalty? Um, Whatever I think, I mean, you can sort of, uh, I think Arendt believes that. And, um, and I think she believes it, especially um, in a case uh, like Eichmann, where she says that the earth cries out for vengeance. Um, there are times when simply uh, the, the crime, the, the pride, the hubris needs to be um, responded to in kind. And, um, and that's her argument there with Sholem, um, for that. Um, you know, whether I think the death penalty is good or not is, is, is sort of irrelevant. Um, you know, I think that there's a, I think that I will tell you this, I know I don't like to, I will say this. I think that non- moral justifications for the death penalty are wrong, right? The moral justification for the death penalty is difficult to hold on to in a non-religious, largely atheistic, immoral public world. That said, if we fully abandon the death penalty, um, the ethical foundation of our legal system will probably completely disappear. Um, and I find that problematic as well. So that doesn't give you an answer to the question of whether I like the death penalty or not, but it does show you how I think through some of the questions that are involved in it. Okay. Thank you, Professor Roger. Yep. James. Oh boy, Roger. Last, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were reading in the 460s and she was really specific about what was evil and she was describing uh, the destruction of people as superfluous and superfluity, a central calamity of our century. And then she moves to this, this new thinking about the uh, about evil 
that it's the banality of evil. And between Tyree Nichols and everything that's going on in the world today, you can just tune in and I feel like I'm swimming in the fungus and I'm just sucking up the fungus. I don't know who to hate, who to love, what characteristics I should be prejudiced against. How do I develop my healthy sense of hate? And I'm just, there's so much hate out there. I just, I can't find the hate in me. I can't find who to hate. And I'm, I'm wondering, is there at, at the root, which I, I'm surprised in this book, the Jewish writings, there's no discussion of the richness of what it is to be a Jew. Did I miss it? No, you didn't. Um, I mean, so there's a lot in your question, James. Thanks. Um, I mean, on the last part, you know, when Golda Meir says to Hannah Arendt, you know, I, as a socialist, I don't believe in God. I believe in the Jewish people. Arendt's response is the greatness of this people was once that it believed in God. Once that it believed in God. You know, oh. Arendt is, is, is certainly not a religious individual. Um, and I think, I think why there's not a whole lot about the richness of Judaism in this book is that she thinks that um, that at least look there are there are religious Jews um, and, and and they live they may live a rich Jewish life um, but they are not um, a large part of the public life of the countries in which they live. Um, you know, one of the things going on in Israel right now is that for the first time really in, I think maybe someone will correct me, but I think for the first time in the history of the state of Israel, um, the ultra religious parties are, are part of the coalition of the government. Uh, this has never happened before. There's always been an unwritten rule in Israeli politics to keep the Orthodox out, the, the ultra-Orthodox out of politics. Um, and, um, and, and that's part of what I think aren't largely, uh, you know, she, she thinks it's, I think she thinks the state of Israel is a homeland for people who are Jewish and she thinks being Jewish matters. But for her, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a fact to be a Jew, as she says. It's one of the undisputable facts of my life and one I'll never be sad for. But is it a meaningful fact? I think for her, largely, the meaning of it is, is when she's attacked as a Jew. And she doesn't see that as a negative. She sees that as part of who she is. But she doesn't see it um, as a part of her rich internal life. Um, uh, and so... When she writes about Jewish writings or Jewish questions, it's more political questions and less religious questions. And I think you're right to notice that, and it's an important. Um, but in that, and into the extent she's, you know, that's her view. I think she's very much in line with much of the public Jewish culture of her time and and even of ours. Um, uh, but you know. She also is someone who, yeah, she grew up not religious and she went through the Holocaust and religious religion was just not at the center of her thought. Um, on the on the question of evil, you know, I think uh, there's two different kinds of evil we're talking about. So the evil of superfluity and um, and of superfluous people is sort of how evil manifests itself in the world. Um, that uh, there are people who are superfluous, and and this is for her sort of the the epitome of of a kind of evil system. Banality is related to it, but but banality is is the attitude of the people perpetrating the evil, as opposed to um, you know the, the 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 actual deeds of the, or the the effect of superfluity. At least that's how I, I try to think about it. Um, you know, who to hate? 
Is Tyree uh, Nichols is Tyree Nichols superfluous, or the guys that were beating him superfluous? Where's well, the you, you answer that question, James? Do you, you know the how was he treated? Oh, I mean, I think the answer is in that instance, he was treated as a superfluous person. I don't think you can. Now, let me let me add that the response by the Memphis Police Department and others has been to not make him superfluous and try and find meaning and import in it. And and at least that should be noted. But I I think I think you're right that that he was um treated as a superfluous person as are um you know as are many people who encounter um uh systems and bureaucracies uh in which they are simply dehumanized and depersonalized uh but 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 there's no doubt that that i think he was in that case and if if you want to think of it that way um you know i think you can develop uh, a critique of um, policing uh, and certain policing practices and cultures of policing in this country, um, which uh, seem to uh, encourage um, treating people as superfluous. She's mentioning how we get people to carry out their own death sentences, right? In the in, in in her account of the camps, yes. I mean, not in this particular essay, but in others we've yeah. read, yes. She's she's talking about how if you so dehumanize people in these camps that they will um, walk to their own deaths, which is what they did. Um, I don't think that's the same case of what happened with Tyree Nichols. He didn't walk to his own death, um, but. Uh, but yes, that's that's sort of the extreme uh, level of of um, dehumanization and uh, making people into surplus uh, people that that she has in mind. Is there banality in that? So I mean, the no, I mean, I don't. Well, okay, so the banality as a surface product is that for anybody to participate in such a system, right? Whether they be Jewish guards or German guards or journalists or whomever, they have to make a decision to participate. And um, they may say, well, I couldn't stop it. And she's like, well, maybe you can't, although maybe you could, but maybe you can't, but you can at least not participate in it. And to the extent you participate in it, you are going along with the surface. You are not thinking. You are not being independent. You're, you're not stopping and thinking and interrupting the system of evil. That's what she calls banality. That's the, the lack of thought that she calls banality. Hanging out in the fungus. Hanging out in the fungus. Exactly. Ooh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, James. Joanne. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to mention that I, I thought the section on public spirit versus public opinion was really profound. And, and I've never read the Federalist Papers, by the way, but um, I have read Rousseau pretty, pretty well. And this reminded me of a point in Rousseau, uh, I guess it's only in the social contract where he talks about the general will. Because I think what Madison is re referring to in public spirit versus public opinion is the general will. And, and Rousseau says it is one of the very hardest things to figure out. Uh, and it's it's always intrigued me because it's so, I, th I think it is, something i think it is a thing but getting to that thing is is very difficult and maybe she doesn't maybe she should have spent more time on that or perhaps she does somewhere else because i think it needs to um have some serious attention 
And when I when I think about um, Biden's State of the Union message and people like uh, the Congresswoman from Georgia in her ugly display, I, I, I think of that as public opinion. And I think what was what is so awful about seeing that in a congressional setting is that it has no business in a congressional setting. A congressional setting, a, a, an official government setting, is, is a place where one hopes that one's trying to get to the general will or public spirit versus public opinion. Now, I do think there's a place for public opinion, obviously. I think going to rallies, going to demonstrations, going to parades, or doing whatever you want to do for the causes that you care about are important and valid and, and should continue to happen. And I, I don't think that she's making an argument against that, but I'm not, I'm not sure. So I, I just wanted to say that about public, public spirit versus yeah. Opinion. So, it's another thing I wanted to mention, uh, and I and I this is a direct question for you, Roger. Is I see Heidegger in the background. He's the phantom here of her discussions on thinking. Um, it's such a Heideggerian analysis of thinking, and I and I felt that when I read the Eichmann book too. And she doesn't refer to him. I mean, this notion of deep thinking or or when she talks about Eichmann as being someone who is thoughtless, who does not think, he refuses to think. He that's what banality means for her. And and um Heidegger calls people to do that. Uh, certainly in Being in Time, which was published in the late 20s, but uh, later also. And I haven't read her book. Uh, I mean, I haven't read the uh, collection of letters between Arendt and Heidegger, but I just wonder if you think too that she is, what I think is she's purposely not um, mentioning Heidegger uh, in this in these kinds of analyses, because he is a little bit of a, more than a little bit of a problem, even in the 60s. In the early 60s, we didn't know the degree to which he was truly and authentically a Nazi. So that's all I have to say. I, I can't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry, there was some noise in the background here. I muted myself and I forgot. Thank you. Um, a couple of things, Joanne, and thank you. On the Heidegger question, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to, to go into it fully. Um, Arendt obviously studied with Heidegger. She was deeply influenced by him in many ways. Um, but she clearly also um, saw his work as... Um, as brilliant as it was, and she thought it was brilliant, and as powerful it was, and she thought it was powerful, as 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 insufficient and mistaken. And on the question of thinking, um, and I've written a fair bit about this, uh, you know, Heideggerian thinking uh, is a, a thinking that seeks to um, bring one into uh, uh, a kind of relationship with being, Dasein. Um, and man, is it powerful what he says, but man, does it have nothing to do with the world? Um, and Arendt's um, thinking is deeply impacted by Heidegger in its attempt to think thinking as a meaningful idea, but it's, in, it's imagined directly in counterposition to Heidegger as well. Um, insofar as that thinking is about engaging in and stopping to think about the world, not about being. And that's a, that's a huge difference that, that needs to be um, um, uh, 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 mentioned. Someone, that's, that's just, some, important. someone just wrote that, you know, Heidegger could think deeply, but not in, in an enlarged sense. Well, he could think in an enlarged sense as it recurs to being and to different philosophers and to the history of philosophy. 
but not in the sense of he was not trying to think about, um, you know, well, what is my neighbor down the street or my Muslim neighbor or my Jewish neighbor or my Zoroastrian neighbor or whatever, try to think that was not his project. And um, Arendt rebels against that. Um, on the on the question of um, of public opinion and public spirit, I'm going to um, I think. If I understood your question correctly, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with your answer, um, which is that Arendt is deeply critical of Rousseau, and she would call Rousseau's what Rousseau calls the general will, which is um, not anyone's particular will, but is the, all the particular wills sort of um, uh, uh, cleansed of any particularity into a generality that is valid for all, that's what she would call public opinion. Um, and she sees Rousseau's general will as profoundly dangerous. Um, uh, and um, she's one of those, now, I mean, I will, I will just say, there are different readings of Rousseau, right? And we should just be clear about this, but Arendt has a very strong, very negative reading of Rousseau. Um, she's one of the most um, negative readers of Rousseau in that sense. For Rousseau, for our end, Rousseau is a thinker of we need to um, overcome our particularity, what she would call our individual particular opinions, in order to all agree on a general will. And if we don't agree on it, we have to be forced to agree on it or forced to be free in Rousseau's famous phrase, which she found deeply offensive. So um, for her, public spirit means that each of us has our own particular opinion, and yet we can um, try to, through thinking and enlarged mentality, um, listen to other opinions, and then decide whether we still think our opinion is right, change it or not, and hold on to our opinions or modify our opinions, but it's not to her, her aim is not to come up with a general will or a common opinion. That's what she calls public opinion. So she's actually quite suspicious of, of that idea. Um, and thus, contra Rousseau, Arendt believes that um, the government should be much less involved in our daily lives than a Rousseauian would believe, right? I mean, she thinks that um, we, the government should only act when there's what she calls the lowest, you know, the, there's gotta be a foundation that we agree on, right? And we all share. That is a general will to some degree or a public opinion, but, there has, but it's very small, it's very low. And then on top of that, there's a lot of room for individual opinions, particular opinions, disagreements, plurality, et cetera. And um, she thinks that you need a constitutional system that allows people who disagree to live together, not a system that tries to make everybody agree on a general will. That's, that's their big difference. Well, I, I agree certainly that Rousseau tends toward the totalitarian, especially in the social contract. But I think that the idea of public spirit is is um, vague, really. And you know the, the steps that one would take between public knowing what public a valid public spirit is, and then creating public policy, um, that that is pretty murky for me. And I, and I don't think that just having town halls um, is going to do it. I mean, it it almost Although what you what you said, it really helps me place all of this quite a bit, but it almost sounds like she is more of an anarchist <laughs> than, than anything. Yeah. Um, she, you know, there are some people who read, have a kind of anarchic reading of Arendt. Um, I don't think she's an anarchist, but she is a believer in that politics is about disagreement and plurality. I mean, plurality is the fundamental experience of the public world for her. And, uh, you know, if you go back to that quote from Madison that she, that I read, 
Um, uh, today, and it's on page um, 477, she says, um, when men exert their reason coolly and freely on a variety of distinct questions, they inevitably fall into different opinions on some of them. That's Madison. Mm -hmm. But that's Arendt, as far as I understand Arendt, right? And it's not Rousseau. And, and that's what we have to understand in that regard. Thank you. Yep. Gilbert. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, as uh, I am very, very interested uh, in her great ideas, uh, I will do. I will do like first to comment to her personal responsibility. So uh, for that, my point of view, she deserves great gift. So let me go back to the question, which is the kind of uh, supporting Please, sir, if you could meet her face to face, what will do you encourage her to continue doing it in terms of writing? On the other hand, if again you could meet her. What will do you encourage her not to keep writing? Thank you. I don't know if I can answer either of these, but the first one was what would I encourage her to write? And the second is what would I encourage her not to write? Yes, yes, please. I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. Um, you stumped me, Gilbert. Uh, you know, I mean, I, okay, I can say this. I wish she had finished the book on judgment. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of us wish that. Um, uh, you know, I'd love, to, I'd love to see her. I don't know. Uh, I don't, and I don't know if there's anything I would encourage her not to write about. Um, but uh, I'd love to see her writing today about artificial intelligence. I think she'd have a lot to say about that. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to know what she thinks about our uh, social media. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, anyway, I mean, these are all these are all important questions. But I don't. I have. Maybe, maybe one day in the future, I'll meet her in another place, but uh, so you will all, and you'll get to ask her these questions directly. So I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Gilbert. I, I, I have no good answers to your questions, but thank you. You are much welcome, sir. Yeah, Hannah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, well, I actually just wanted to bring up a current event that's sort of germane. And also, I mean, I just, you know, really love that last paragraph uh, in the letter to, to Gershom Scholem, the great reviver and of, of uh, mysticism, Jewish mysticism. Um, I love the paragraph and it was really interesting to see her say uh, never radical that that evil she's changed her mind and see that uh, believes that evil is never radical but only extreme in other words it's a lot more prevalent than something that is radical would be i think is what she means right um and um i think um you know i just think it's brilliant and i you know i very carefully reread uh, eichmann in jerusalem and just thought it was incredible. And I sort of, but 
you know, the current event I wanted to raise just for the group was that uh, in June of 2022, um, Israel, the general public, heard uh, these tapes, these Eichmann tapes that were taped in 1957 uh, by this Dutch Nazi journalist named William Sasson. And um, there's a lot, and, and the tapes were known uh, during the Eichmann trial, but uh, when Gideon Hausner tried to get them, they, the owner said, well, I'll sell them to you for 20 grand, but you can't play them until, you can't get them until after the trial. And then Eichmann knew that they were trying to get them. And he said, well, you know, they'll be distorted. You know, there won't be enough context, blah, blah, blah. So in the end, they didn't publish these, these tapes, which there apparently were 70 hours of them. But because the tapes were expensive, uh, Sasson retaped over a bunch of them. But there's 15 hours has been released to the Israeli public. It was released last summer. And it was a sort of tremendous interest by the whole country, young and old, to listen to these tapes. And then there was a big flurry of, well, does this disprove Hannah Arendt's banality of evil thesis? Because in the tapes, uh, uh, Eichmann presents a, a really very different persona, a very determined, um, uh, you know, I'm not just a cog, I'm not just a functionary but I uh, knew precisely what I was doing. And if I could have killed 10 million of the enemy, I would have gone to my grave happy to have done so. So it really, um, in some quarters, I think among philosophers and others and, and Jewish studies people, et cetera, has opened the question of, well, does this now negate the, neg the banality of evil? I personally don't think it does. I think what she said is just beyond brilliant. And um, I don't think it does at all, because the non-thinking uh, is a, such a deep thing. Um, and uh, even what he said doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't just so focused on his career, you know, um, and that that was as far as his 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 thinking went. But in any event, it is a big thing now that the tapes are out. And there's a documentary called The Devil's Something. You may know of it. So I just thought I'd raise that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, so Willem Sassen was a Dutch journalist, Nazi Dutch journalist, who uh, ended up in Buenos Aires, along with many former Nazis. Uh, so did Eichmann. And um, Sassen wanted to... Um, you know, was 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 trying to uh, resurrect Nazism in Germany in the 1950s, and thought that it could still that the German people could still be I saved didn't know that. to be Nazis, and so he went and interviewed a bunch of former Nazis uh, in who are living in in Buenos Aires, hoping to um, you know uh, to to sort of resurrect or, or resuscitate the Nazi Party. And one of them was was Adolf Eichmann, um, and and these tapes, uh, um, uh, as you said, um, were some of them have been taped over, but they there's a number that do exist. Uh, a number of a, a, a number of transcripts of them were published in the late 1950s, early 1960s by Willem Sassen. Um, uh, oh, in life. In Life magazine, yeah, yeah, and other in, in English and other places as well, and um, oh. and and almost, and Arendt read those and read them closely, um, and there were longer transcripts as well. Uh, uh, oh, that, I didn't know that. That that I mean of, of Eichmann's autobiography, which you know was his attempt to justify himself, which was uh, which she was able to read. Never was made public, but she was able to read. Um, um, uh, in part um, through a deal she made with someone in the Israeli court. I don't know how. Um, um, so there's two things to say is that most of the quotations that are, you know, being bandied about, right? Or, you know, saying that, oh, this disproves Arendt 
So for example, mm. I even said things like, you know, if I could have finished the job, I would have jumped, gladly jumped in my grave. If I could kill 10 million of my enemy. Um, uh, Arendt read all those, right? She oh. knew about those. Um, wow. So this was not, um, you know, so one of the things that's often said in these articles, because people don't know what they're talking about is, right. oh, Arendt couldn't have known this. And if she had, she would have changed her mind. Wow. That's simply not the case. Um, now, that does that's simply a fact and we can we can then say what does it mean but it does mean um as i've tried to argue with people who i mean the 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 there are a lot of non-intelligent people making these claims and there's some very intelligent people making these claims and one of them who's quite intelligent is a woman named bettina von stangnath who wrote a book yes, Eichmann, i Eichmann, heard her yeah eichmann yeah. for jerusalem or eichmann before jerusalem and and she and I have had some some you know long discussions about this. Um, in the end, uh, you know, I think that their arguments simply show that they haven't tried to understand what Arendt is saying. Um, uh, that's a that's a we can have that argument. We don't have to agree, etc. Um, I think I think it's great that the tapes are, are coming out. Um, again. Uh, I think that they are an important historical um, source and largely they've been hoarded by a couple of people and only those people have been able to listen to them and write about them. And that has prevented other people from accessing them. And now they're coming out. There's a new documentary, as you said. Um, and I imagine there will be a lot of research done on them. Uh, and I think that's positive. Uh, but I think what's important to remember is that Arendt's arguments are actually um, largely uh, are, are made largely knowing most of what Eichmann, most of the important stuff that Eichmann said on those tapes. And um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that you have to understand is that I, Arendt does not make the cog argument, right? Eichmann makes the cog argument. Arendt disagrees with it. And this is one of the things that a lot of her critics keep going on and on about and saying, oh, she mistakenly called him a cog. Well, she didn't do that. So, um, Arendt. Oh, it's so good to hear this. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to read Bettina Van Stenger's book is a good book. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, I think there's, I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's, it's certainly a book worth reading. And, and I think there's responses to it um, by many people, Jerome Cohn, me, Corey Robin, many others, um, uh, uh, Sheila Benabib, and 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 they're worth uh, listening to in in all of their uh, different sides. Um, but yeah, I, I the documentary was I think largely in Hebrew. Um, I I think an English translation is supposed to be coming out this year. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I certainly want to, and when we do, maybe we'll figure out a way to talk about it um, on this. Roger, group. just. Yeah. Roger, can I say just one more thing? Yeah. It would be so great if you could write an article and get it published like in the New York Review of Books or something, telling people that like she had already heard these tapes, which is so important for me to hear. Of course, you already heard me say, I, I don't think it changed a thing about the truth of what she wrote, but it's really, really great for me to hear that she heard these things. And just a final thing I wanted to say, I think the line, only the good had depth, has depth and can be radical, is just the most amazing line ever. Because what it's saying is goodness is rare. Goodness is, you know, really incredibly, you know, I mean, basically that's what she's saying, which is sad, but it's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, statement. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to say that incredible statement i agree thank, thank you. you thank you so much for that corrective information it was extremely important to me no it's good uh you know there there was a there was an article in the new york review of books um making these wrong arguments about and i wrote a letter responding to it it's published also in the new york review of books but oh good. that just shows you who the new york review of books asks to write the articles versus not so, but okay. Um, Vigdis, you're up. Uh, yes, I have a comment on uh, this sentence that she says several times that 
Uh, there is such a thing as a basic gratitude for everything that is as it is. And I related to, to the book, uh, Richard Bernstein wrote about uh, the Jewish writings of Aram. And this comes in the concluding remarks where he goes to blindness and insight. And he starts with two quotes. One is from uh, where um, it, Levinas cites Franz Rosenschweig, and he says, the good Lord did not create religion, he created the world. And then he has a quote, Arendt wrote to quote Blumenfeld, the world as God created it, it seems to me a good one. And uh, I think Bernstein's uh, interpretation of this is quite interesting. He sees that Arendt's eighth theological secure of faith is one that is world-centered, not God-centered. And he also says that Arendt's faith, like that of so many Jews before her, is directed more to creation than to the creator. And to me, this is kind of gives a lot of meaning to, to something else she says, as we, has re we have read as well. Um, me being an agnostic and also being quite fond of the planet we live on, the Earth. And she has also some other places where she, she appreciates the Earth. But it goes to... to one thing is in this piece when she says that evil has no roots and that because think and thinking is a, a, the good is in a way what has roots so so if you you use thinking then then evil thing will dissolve by itself because it has no roots because it on the surface and that goes in a way quite well with this but it's also what she says about the kibbutzim. And uh, I also was thinking of what Ken brought up last time on this, where she talks about true reality. And you and Jana had different interpretation where Jana saw it in a bit like a visionary comment. And I think it's, to me, it's quite interesting because it, it makes sense in a way to, to her view on these things. I don't know if that makes sense at all to you, but to me, it was quite interesting. And I, I like that. And I also think the use of God in this uh, relation is, at least to me, the term God, especially within philosophy is more, it's not like God in religion. It's more like whatever force that creates what we have. So, so yeah. I don't know if that made especially much sense, but I found that very interesting and 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 a good way to to read her from. Thank you, Vigdis. Yeah, I mean, I I, I certainly take. Uh, I mean, the world and worldliness is at the absolute center of Arendt's thinking. It's an important part of of her thinking, and um, you know, I'm not. And, and uh, you know, I think pe some people have been trying to bring it out more in the last few years. Um, uh, the world is, is that which um, we fabricate um, and we create in our actions together. Um, and... Uh, and 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 the kibbutzim argument is the kibbutzim is is also I think part of that um, worldliness uh, that she's into. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I picked up all the different connections in what you're saying, um, and uh, or, or, or have much to add to it. I think um, focusing on the importance of world is is meaningful to her. The love of the world uh, is the love um, of this world that we have. Um, been born into. Now, that world is on the one hand, um, parts of it are created before any humans were there, right? Whether it's by God or by natural forces. And so we're born onto an earth, what she calls an earth, which is not, which is beyond our control or has been for most of humanity. But on that earth, we build a world, which is a human world, and we fabricate it. Um, 
one of the questions that she begins to raise, and this goes back to Gilbert's question about what I would like her to write on, but she's already writing on it in the 1950s, in the 1950s, is what happens when our capacities of human fabrication increase to such an extent that we not only can build a world on the earth, but we can even remake the earth, right? What happens when we can infuse code into water and infuse code into humans, into genes and infuse code into the earth, you know, the earth or to the air and make oxygen that, you know, cleans carbon dioxide out better than it did or things of that sort. Um, at that point, we begin to fabricate not just a world, but also the earth and even humanity. And, and that's um, one of the, that was, a, that was where she had saw us heading. And in the human condition basically said, you know, this is going to change the very conditions of human life. And we need to think about how it's going to do that. Um, yeah, maybe that's why this um, utterance from uh, from uh, that you said was from uh, Golda Meir uh, shocked Owen so much that she actually uh, that it she believed in the Jewish people when Owen had this uh, shocking that the Jews earlier believed in God and then what yeah. she said and it is in a way the way we believe in our ability. To, to do better than whatever have created the earth that we have. That's exactly uh, right. That's exactly right. Let me try and get to the last two questions or comments by Susan and Vivian. So Susan. Yeah, hi, Roger. Well, mine's gonna be quick now because <laughs> Vigdis between the conversation between you and Vigdis, that was my question was about Arendt and God, knowing her agnostic, maybe atheistic tendencies. I you know, don't know which one. But the, but the comment that she made, the, her reaction to Golder Myers, that, that whole interchange did, uh, it did surprise me because I hadn't, sometimes when Arendt interjects God into the conversation or, the, or her essays, it does make, it kind of pulls me up short because I'm not sure of her thinking and her thinking in relation to God. Now, some of what you and Vigdis were just talking about and the fact that she's more interested in the creation than the creator, I think that that makes good sense. And I understand that from that. But 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 could but what about with, with Golda Meir? Why did that why did the sense that the Jewish people, and I guess that you could say it about all people, the sense that that God is not playing that role anymore. Could you, I don't know, could you maybe just unpack that a little bit for me? What, what, she seems to interject God at interesting times and it does always makes me kind of pull up short a little bit because I don't know why she does that. Yeah, um, I mean, all I can say is what I tried to say earlier. I'll, I'll see if I can say it better or if I can, or maybe it'll come out differently. Um, you know, what makes a Jew a Jew, right? There's different answers to that question. One is that you're discriminated against, you're attacked as a Jew. That's one way of being a Jew, right? There's cultural Judaism, right? But none of that, she would say, is what makes Jews great. And I think what she says, you know, the way she put it is the greatness of this people, right? Was that it once really believed in something, not not in itself, not in the fact that they can exist, not in because anyone can exist. What made them unique was that they believed in God and believed in God in such a way that their trust and love toward God was greater than their fear of God. And that made them live in a, in a unique and particular way. That, so then the, the creator does count then, really, in, in certainly in the Jewish culture for her. In well, in 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 again, as I said, there's different aspects of Judaism, right? And now mm -hmm. we live we live in an age in which there's I mean, I don't know how many kinds of Judaism we can count right now, right? Orthodox, ultra-orthodox, reform, 
Reformation, um, Reconstruction, Conservative, you know, all sorts. And, uh, um, you know, obviously each of these are an attempt by people who are Jewish to make being Jewish rich and meaningful in their lives. Often when they don't believe in God, which was what it usually and originally was about. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that's what she's talking about. And what she's saying is once you no longer believe in God, you know, to then turn and say, well, what we believe in is ourselves, that we're Jews. Um, you know, that seems not something very great. In fact, it seems something quite um, common. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, common in one sense, but also, um, um, you know, dangerous um, in the sense that if you only believe in yourself, you really lose a kind of uh, openness to the world. Mm. Okay. I'm going to just take Vivian's question because we just got a couple minutes. Vivian. Uh, hi. Um, so uh, before I, I try to make my point or response or my points of identification with the uh, pain and excruciation that is on display in the Jewish writings for a million different reasons, I just want to say, uh, by the way, um, uh, when uh, Claude Lanzmann made uh, uh, hundreds of hours of interviews in preparation for his show on these interviews were done closer to 1970 than anything else, I guess. Um, he then spent the rest of his life uh, using that and making several more films until he died using that material. And one of the films, I forget the title, was um, was largely about, um, and he interviewed a Benjamin, I think his name was Benjamin Murmelstein, who had been the last actually surviving, uh, one of the few surviving, but also the last one of the uh, ghetto elders. Uh, I, I'm not sure which ghetto, Warsaw or which, I'm not sure which one, but in any case, interviews him. And I think it was uh, Murmelstein himself, who was actually an eyewitness in Vienna during the night of Kristallnacht in the, uh, in the Altschul, in the, in the huge synagogue in Vienna, who, who said, and I, I don't think I'm, I'm making this up, it was something along the lines of actually seeing Adolf Eichmann there physically smashing the bima. Um, so I don't know if you heard any of that, but anyway, that was absolutely incredible. When I first hear, heard that or him speaking about it or them, uh, you know, interviewing about that, well, that was absolutely incredible. But, but even so, um, for what it's worth, uh, I don't for a minute think that that changes anything um, that Arendt has written uh, in, uh, in anything that she's, uh, you know, analyzed about Eichmann. The other, so, um, just want to say that, um, you know, and, and also maybe, and I think that uh, Gilbert's uh, question about what to write, uh, advice about what to write and what not to write is actually a very profound little question. And I think in some way I'm sort of visiting it here. Uh, you know, this, this brilliant, you know, gifted, original, creative human being um, you know, this fearless woman who is so alone in her pursuit of thinking, honestly, and I hate to sound so hokey and romantic about, about her, her, her very um, 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 unforgiving pursuit, um, channels her considerable pain, you know, all the pain of her, her growing up years, her pain of displacement, her pain of loss, her pain of uh, uh, um, uh, a re rejection and the pain of the crucifixion, what happened after she published the Eichmann stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And her pain is, is utterly commensurate with her, with, her, with her unique gifts. She channels this pain into, into the most powerful analyses in, in, in her work and her, so, you know, which is her work of social critique. I mean, it's absolutely incredible the way she channels this pain that would, uh, that could cripple someone else who was busy with such an unforgiving project. Um, you know, think of the pain of, you know, um, just obviously, I mean, uh, with her, you know, her Heidegger, for example, her, her teacher, her, her lover, her great mentor, her most admired, the pain of his utter failure as a human being for her, etc. That, you know, that, and then, and then as at least as much 
the pain of the um, rift that develops uh, after what she writes about Eichmann with Gershom Sholem. I think Gershom Sholem, uh, um, uh, the friend that he was, must have represented so very much for Hannah Arendt. He must have been whatever notion of home she had. I mean, that, that, that she could find it in, in the contact. And here, here there is this friendship that becomes un irreparably uh, uh, fractured and they never come back from this rift ever. This must, I mean, this is enough to, you know, kill a person. And I'm sure that, you know, part of why she dropped dead so early and so suddenly from a heart attack was because her heart must have been absolutely broken. I don't blame Gershom Sholem. I'm just saying that I so identify with the extent of the pain that that must have been for both of them, but especially for Hannah Arendt in, in her, uh, uh, really in her aloneness. And I just wanted to say how incredible in terms of visiting Gilbert's question, in terms of um, the, the idea of what to write and what not to write. I think that uh, because um, she was so unforgiving of herself, she was so hardcore in her pursuit and her pursuit itself, in my view, was so unforgiving altogether that uh, she would obviously constantly, the price of that was constantly shooting herself in the foot. And, 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 you know, not pleasing most people. And, and this is excruciating right there. Whether she, it's nothing to do with what she should have done or what she shouldn't have done. But she, she never, she never played the game. She, she was never expedient. She was never mercenary. She, she, she followed that mission. And she was a, a woman on a mission. Um, um, I, I, I can't, I can't, 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 she says, what this is on 270. What confuses you is that my arguments and my approach are different from what you are used to. In other words, the trouble is that I am independent. By this, I mean, on the one hand, that I do not belong to any organization and always speak only for myself. And on the other hand, that I have great confidence in Lessing's substdenken, for which I think no ideology, no public opinion, and no convictions can ever be a substitute. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that there's a lot of things that Arendt deserves our praise for and our reading for, but nothing more than her independence. Um, the fact that she is a self-thinker and substanker in that way, and, and it comes out of a crucible, clearly. Um, and uh, I think Vivian said it very well. So. We will end on that. Um, and I thank you all. We have one more week of reading, um, finishing the Jewish writings. And then we will move on to thinking about Hannah Arendt and race on the 24th. But next week on the 17th, we will finish the Jewish writings. So I look forward to seeing you then. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and I'll see you next week. Thanks very much.